Hello, everybody. Welcome once again to another installment of A Rebel Without Applause, coming to you as I always do from my little television studio apartment in this, the wood of the holly. And today I have a very special guest, and I've been privileged to actually work with him. He is a writer, a director, and I might add a very talented actor, but most recently he has achieved something that is well, it's amongst the rarest thing that can happen in Hollywood, and that is an actual movie that's a hit in theaters. And it's called 80 for Brady, and with me today is Kyle Marvin, who directed and co-wrote this movie, which I was privileged to be in. Welcome to my little cage here, Kyle. Thanks for joining me, I so appreciate it. My pleasure. Just tell me right off the bat, what does it feel like to have a hit movie? It's strange. It's a strange thing. It's it's sort of like everything in life where you always feel like, you know, when I get when when X happens, I'm gonna feel like something. And every time you get there, it doesn't really feel like the the thing you expected. Um, uh -huh. I'm certainly really proud of the movie. I'm really proud of who turned up to see the movie, um, which was an audience that people had sort of said wouldn't come back to movie theaters. Um, and that I think I'm really proud of, that, that it sort of set uh, a message to our industry to just say, like, if, if you make content that are for the people who, uh, who you know, who you want to have see the movie, they'll show up and, and see it. So, um, you know, it's great. It's awesome. It, I try and keep an even keel in my life because there's highs and lows in this industry. And so I feel like if I can keep a relatively even keel, I'll be all right. So I'm taking it all in stride. Good. I've experienced the lows. I've never been quite to the highs. I've been somewhere in the media, <laughs> you know. <laughs> ultimately, That's how it goes. Yeah, ultimately, you know, my experience is the process is the reward. The opportunity yeah, to make movies is, and just to be in the arena, to fail or succeed, that is the rarest privilege. And I... I had to learn that lesson a little bit the hard way. You know, we were talking before this, and it's and it's great because every person who 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 joins you in in a movie in every capacity on set, uh, if they all try and bring their best to that to that position, as as lowly as it could be, the PA on set who's like going to do coffee runs, like every every person on set adds tremendous value to the overarching production. And that's very true with actors who come really well prepared and who can bring things to that role because every role is important. You know, every, every person, even, even the people walking in the background, if they're, if they understand their motivation and they understand what they're doing and they're doing it naturally, it creates a tapestry that feels natural and organic and it builds towards, you know, a better movie. And I think people shouldn't disregard their contributions to a movie because all of those things matter in the grand scheme of, of the movie itself. I think they all contribute to the quality of the final product. Yeah, they're all links in a chain. And by the way, if one of those little links doesn't work, you see it, it just jumps out and leaps out at you. So you're trying to trick people in essence, like you're trying to convince them that this artifice is real in the moment. And if anything breaks the artifice, and that could be camera work, and that could be sound, and that could be a million things, um, any one of those, you know, cracks in the armor pull them away from fully committing to the project. And so like, you know, the more that people commit and the more that people live in, in, in honesty in those moments, the better the overall. I think you're probably the first director in cinema history to direct four legends and a goat. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there's been four legends and a goat, but just not four legends and the goat. The goat, um, right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can um, only imagine yeah. what that was like. I mean, if you were intimidated or will they accept me or, I mean. Yeah, it was, it was intimidating at first uh, in like those initial conversations when we were sort of like, uh, you know, having the very first conversations and getting their attachments. Those moments are real, feel really precarious because it's kind of like going on a first date. You know what I mean? You're trying to be authentic. You're trying to put your best foot forward. But, you know, ultimately, you're going to have to be who you are and you're going to have to hope that, like, your, your relationship works out. Um, and so that part is really daunting. I think once we got into production, they're all such consummate professionals. And the truth is, is that on a film set, 
everyone wants the same thing, which is a great performance. And so there is immediately shared sort of uh, interest and shared activity towards making a good performance. Um, and so it became more natural pretty quickly. But yes, there were definitely moments where I was like, I'm going to look back on this and think, my God, you know what I mean? I'm like sitting here with these you know, individuals having this experience. And it's, it was very, um, you know, it was very magical in that, in that you way. Know, I was going over some of the credit lists of Jane, of course, you know, and yeah. I actually had the opportunity to tell her I just saw Clued again and her performance with Donald Sutherland is so exquisite. Oh, yeah. There's yeah. moments yeah. where she just takes his hand and they're walking, they're shopping for vegetables and you go, oh my God, they're in love, you know, this, and, and I could just, from Jane's movie, some of her, she was such a great comedian early on with Barefoot in the Park. And one of my favorite Westerns, was Cat Ballou. I don't know if you ever saw that movie. Oh, I did. I did see Cat Ballou. Yeah, it's a great Western. Yeah. Shot in, I, uh, shot in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, I think, some of that. Yes. And, you know, I've got Lee Marvin and Oscar. That movie also had um, Nat King Cole and Stubby K singing, you know, at the beginning. Singing, yeah, that song is iconic. Yeah. Right. And the Fairley Brothers, you know, ripped that off with um, yeah, of something about Mary. That was just like, okay, I got it, you know, but it's not a ripoff, you know, they're sitting on their shoulders. That's but, an homage or in the tapestry of subconscious. Right. So and then when I and... saw your movie yesterday, which I really loved, you as an actor in The Climb with the chapter headings. Right. We do it too. The Fortune Cookie. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, but it's just. One of my favorite Billy Wilder movies, also sports related because the guy gets injured at, at a Cleveland Browns football game. But um, yeah, I mean, when you think of That's some awesome. of the directors, uh, Sidney Pollack and, you know, just it, the list goes on with Jane, Barefoot in the Park. Uh, I mean, there's so many movies, um, uh, The China Syndrome. And of course, Sally, I thought her performance in your movie was sublime. She just yeah. has an incredible naturalness and belief that I kind of thought it in a way anchored the movie for me in many ways, you know, she, yeah, she, she, for sure, she has a great gut instinct toward character. And I think she, you know, she is a force in herself in that she knows creatively where she wants to take something. She has a very like solid solidified idea um, in terms of what needs to be done along the way in order to reinforce that. And I think she was a great partner in that sense that she, she was very, you know, she was very confident in, in where, um, where, where she found honesty inside the character and then uh, what the priorities were in terms of her delivery, her line delivery. And I think she's spectacular in that sense. Yeah, she was great. It inspired casting with her husband, Bob Balaban, who I think. Yeah, he's the best. <laughs> he's, you know, I think. I he, love he, Bob Balaban. His uncle was, was a, like a major studio executive in Hollywood history. Uh, you yeah, know. I remember. I remember hearing that at some point when. Oh yeah, were... Balaban. I think was head of Paramount. Um, yeah, Paramount. And, I, and I actually think his great uncle. I'm not sure there was the basis for what makes Sammy run the novel, which was. Oh. Yeah, so he's intertwined, and of course, you know, I think about Sally Fields. I think about, of course, Norma Ray and Smokey and the Bandit. Yeah. But her relationship uh, with. Was some one of the great directors for actors, Martin Ritt, you know, she did, yes. who did, I believe, did that movie and was, uh, and then Rita is in perhaps the most influential movie that I've ever seen for me, especially for the one I directed, which was Carnal Knowledge. I mean, with yeah. Mike Nichols, that's like, I think your movie too had some. I mean, Carnal Knowledge was definitely a, a reference for us, and it's funny because I talked to Rita about Carnal Knowledge too on set because it's because it's a favorite of mine as well, and I was sort of like, "What was it?" I was trying to like glean, you know, get some insight from her of like what that whole experience was like because it was such a, and then her, her role in it is so surreal and and wild, and so we had a we had a great conversation about that. Yeah, and then I'm just see, these are all the rivers that flow now yes. into you. Because then with the last Lily, of you know, I think about the breakthrough movie for her, which was Robert Altman's Nashville, yep. which was almost like reinventing a kind of filmmaking of, um, you know, half improv. Hey, half. Yeah, that sort of verite, um, you know, the camera drifts to the audience and you hear someone talking in your left ear. Yeah. yeah. Now, some of that freedom you had in um, The Climb, but... I felt like in the, the 
in 80 for Brady, you were obviously constrained because you had to prepare a movie that would match seamlessly with a Super Bowl that had occurred. It was 217, but it was the championship for the season of 2016. Uh, that most memorable of comebacks in NFL history. So talk about just how you had to prepare to seamlessly make that work. Yeah, I mean there was two there were two sides to it. One was one was the the visual side because we had to convince the NFL to agree to let us have the footage and and Tom Brady helped a lot in that sense. Um and then we had to sort of see what we had in terms of footage. We had to try and understand and dig deep into their archives. And we flew to um, New Jersey and went to NFL Films and went with their archivists through the old hard drive or the old storage. They have a really robust system for archiving their things. And we went back through all the footage and looked at all the plays and they have numerous cameras. I mean, they have, I think in this one we had 12 cameras that we were using. So mm -hmm. we could see things from 12 different perspectives aside from a couple of roving cameras. And so it had a lot to do with the visual language. What did we have visually? And then story-wise, it was sort of trying to align everyone's needs at the same moment. Our characters' needs, Tom Brady's needs, the movie's needs, and trying to get it worked out so it all lined up uh, in the same moment in a way that felt like everyone benefits from this sort of peak moment or everyone has their lesson to learn together instead of it being sort of one directional or, you know, or like a one note thing. So that was really the challenge for us was how do you line up everyone's stories within the context of a real thing? And how do you visually map the real footage back into our story? And how does our camera language integrate naturally into that, uh, that setting? And so all those things were, it's a bit of a puzzle piece in terms of uh, figuring all those components out. But I think in the end, we. We pulled it off. Well, what I was doing my little part there, you know, with the green screen, looking at yeah. all this stuff, you, you know, there was a lot of screen direction that you had to have thought out which direction the plays are going, which end zone yeah. is being defended, which is being attacked. And, and also just the specific moment in the game, you know, all had to be prefigured. And yeah. like, you did there a really a good job. Yeah, there was a lot of that, a lot of that sort of stuff we had figured out and, and you know, I think I think it's one of the big the big things to as a director you're constantly tracking, which is really how do things fit together is sort of like the director's job because everyone lives in the moment and everyone's trying to do their best work in the moment and and your job as a director is sort of to be a step back from it all, trying to play in play the whole thing out on every side. And so a lot of it had to do with me trying to identify what the footage we were going to do is, what the what we were going to shoot in four days which was the return on that and, and how our, you know, how the line was placed and how we covered it and all those things. I mean, it's part of the challenge of directing really is just managing a lot of that prediction, you know. And, and just also just on the storytelling level, and you alluded to this, you have four basic main characters and they each have their own little you know, back issue, like Sally's trying to break out of, you know, the expand or whatever with her marriage and Jane and reconcile her own beauty. And it was just beautiful. And I, I wanted to just say this, I felt that the movie had a, a sort of some deeper current as well in terms of uh, uh, an answer to how people get discounted for their full humanity as they edge into their elderhood. In a movie like this, you've got four stories that you're trying to not give short shrift to. Like in a in a traditional sense, you have your protagonist and everyone else sort of like supports them and their stories are sort of anecdotal at best. And I think the challenge for this one is we had 90-ish minutes to pull off four as complete backstories as we could pull off while this incredible amount of plot had to happen and you had a whole Super Bowl to get to and play out. And so part of the challenge for us was like how to most potently examine things and try and give a little bit more meat and potatoes to each of the characters while still trying to make it a comedy, give the big comedy set pieces, have a Super Bowl happen and do all of these things. So it was a, a bit of a challenge in terms of how to compress and give everyone as much as possible while still keeping, you know, the freight train moving at high speed so that it felt like a, you know, a movie you'd watch in a movie theater. 
Well, and just to add to that, because you're working now within a studio system, you know, you're, you were, one of the things I enjoy about studio movies historically is that they're about storytelling efficiency. Yeah. And I'm seeing less of that. Uh, a lot of it's just by these long form things where how do we make it longer? <laughs> you know, like the, 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 the limited series uh, with unlimited dialogue. How do they do this? You know, this isn't tar, but you manage to seemingly satisfy your bosses and the, and the larger demands of commercial movie making. Yeah. And um, a 90 minute movie is a lost art, I think. I mean, if you look back at the at the mid 30s and you look at those movies and some of them are 58 minutes long and they're masterpieces and you're like, oh, wow, they do great work and character. They have great world building and it's 58 minutes long, you know, like. And, and so I think there's a I think there's a I think there's an art to doing a compressed movie. And I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't put myself up there on the shelf with those ones, but I do think that they're, you know, I, I, I admire and uh, would love to try and do something. And again, 58 minutes is maybe too small. Yeah. Because I, I'd like to take my time, but, I, but there is a, there is a beauty to um, being able to do it in a compressed space and, uh, and sort of carving and carving and carving until you get what you want. I mean, the director's cut of the, of 80 for Brady, I think it was like two hours and 20 minutes. You know, it's, it was a like, I put it all in there and it was like the long, slow jokes, as slow as I could go. And actually we cut more scenes out than we cut them down. We cut like more fat off the bone than we did like lose a little bit of the pathos of the, mm -hmm. of the jokes. But I think certainly it's a more palatable movie. It's a more enjoyable watch uh, as it stands now than my director's cut. You probably slog through a couple scenes thinking like, Okay, I'm done. You know what I mean? I've, I've had my I've had my fill of this scene. Well, you know what do they say? Brevity is the soul of uh, filmmaking. So yeah. you yeah. did a, a a great job. This was the antidote to a movie like Tar. Yes, <laughs> which, is, yeah, it's like, like, which I love. Like, don't get me wrong. I, I I'm a huge fan of European cinema, and so like <laughs> I'll sit through I'll sit through those movies. You know where like four hours in, you're like, wait, are we at the midpoint yet? Um, yeah. Well, but, you know, my grandfather was in the distribution business at Warner Brothers. My grandfather, I will say this, he was president of Warner Brothers. He started in 1927, but he never made a movie. He sold them. And, yeah. you know, their concerns was, well, we got it. We got to rotate that. We want five plays a day or whatever. <laughs> you know, there were real concerns. They yeah. didn't have an open ended video and streaming life um, to recoup their investment. But now I want to say this to the people that watch is. I want to talk about The Climb, which I thought was a great movie. Yeah. And, you know, I met you and you're distracted directing and, you know, I didn't have a chance to really say anything to you or talk to you. Uh, I wanted to be a successful widget in your factory <laughs> and nothing burps on Bill. Just we keep going and, you know, one more link in that chain. But you are an inspired actor. And that performance in that movie and your collaboration with um, Mr. Cavino was inspired. And I, I just wanted that to be said. And yeah. I'm a comedian, actor, writer. I don't put boundaries. It's whatever door opens, I will charge through. Yeah. Um, you know, I spread my rejection around without hesitation. Yeah. But I, I just want you to talk about your journey as an actor, because clearly that had to give you some cred with those actresses. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, we I did a show called We Crash which came out right as the as our movie was coming out and I think the actresses we would talk about it on set because it was sort of happening in real time and that definitely I think actors seeing actors act who are it, it changes the conversation because there is a sort of like a shared we're in the trenches, you know what it's like to like, you know, be in a scene and and be floundering in a moment and needing the support, you know, of something else or of some physical action or things to help you through. So I think that shorthand helped a lot. In terms of my journey, I came up through commercial production. I've always loved acting. I, I did it when I was younger and, but I, it really felt unattainable to me when I, when I sort of started my life in the working world and I had kids young and I had to work. And so I, I was in commercial production. I just ran a production company and made my money by, you know, shooting whatever I could shoot. 
and on the side because I was because I was savvy with production we, we owned cameras and I knew how to set you know a production together we just became producers by default um, and we were surrounded by such talented people we just sort of let them do the work and we supported them and the climb came about because the truth is we would mess around all the time we had the cameras we'd set up for like a beauty uh you know a beauty setup and we'd have a white psych with like you know all the things and we'd do that and at the end of the day we'd have two hours and we would just can i swear on your podcast you can say whatever you want. You would just fuck around. We, yeah. would, we would do whatever we wanted. We'd be like, great, what's a funny thing we can do in this thing? Great, put two chairs out there and a, we got a pumpkin, put a pumpkin in there. And it's like, all right, improv. Or we would do all sorts of stuff. So we were constantly playing with the tools we had um, and just messing around, like you said. And, and you know, we we were sort of punching up into the world of indie film. We made, you know, I, I produced uh, three or four by the time we hit the climb. We were just sort of always playing. And I knew... Acting is acting is hard. It's hard work. It's hard work to do auditions. You prep for them. You work hard. You do it, and you know, like, hey, my hat's in the bag, you know. And it could be some casting associate just passes you over by chance. You could be the perfect thing. Like, there, it's just a wild roller coaster of a ride. And so, for me, the climb was a chance for me to just put myself in something because no one else was casting me. No one else is going to put me in something. And so we just said, great, we want to do the thing we want to do. And and it, people responded to the short film, which it, which we shot in between a car commercial and a beauty commercial over oh, a weekend. Yeah. Wow. Um, and then that short got us traction and that, that short became the feature film. And so that was sort of my trajectory, was just trying to build it on my own and continue to play with my friends on the things that we thought were fun and interesting. And, and one of them hit, you know, there's lots of not funny things that people don't like, you know what I mean? Or, or never responded to. And I think part of the lesson there is exactly what you said, which is just be willing to fail and, and try and play around and not treat anything like it's a, like it's a condemnation of your creative impulse, just that it didn't align at the moment, you know what I mean? And so to just keep experimenting and, and poking around and, and something eventually will pop. Well, I will say, just talking about the climb, because I saw it yesterday, you know, there was this, one of the chapters was the, it was, it was either the Thanksgiving or the Christmas. Yeah. And, you know, you cannot do those kind of shots yeah. unless they're well planned. I mean, the mise en scene from those things with the, you know, I'm reminded of like Han and her sisters and those beautiful scenes that yeah. Woody Allen directs in apartments yeah. and enclosed places. I mean, you, those things are have to be choreographed to very choreographed. Yeah. And, and what was interesting and in the, and the beauty of writing your own role is that, you know, Mike and I both wrote it together and were in it as the leads. And so we knew the dialogue, like we had workshopped those scenes over and over and over and over again. And we would perform them with each other, you know, just in, in our office to try and workshop them through and, and whittle them down and wear, the, wear off the edges. Uh, and then the priority just became getting everyone else on board. And, you know, we did a lot of tech scouting, a lot of like prep work, a lot of diagramming just so we understood because there's so many things moving in those that like where does the sound guy go where are the mics planted you know where are the extras going in this moment how do you coordinate a, a interior action with exterior camera work when the camera work outside is inconsistent because it's mm -hmm. on a dolly and who knows when it's going to hit the window and and so like all of those um pieces were sort of had to be really refined and the way that we did that the way we did that movie was we did one day of prep with everyone mm -hmm. where the, the actors weren't in costume, but everyone was there doing the scenes. And then we would just run it, run it, run it, run it, run it. And then we reviewed at night to sort of like see the timing and figure out if there was any gaps with our technical team. And then the next day we would just run the scene back to back, run it, run it, run it, run it, run it. And eventually we, everyone just got a cadence. And then on take five, six, 10, we would say, got it, we nailed it, everything was in place. And then we would push even further as far as we could, and then we'd be done. And then it'd be like, great, we either got the scene or we didn't, but we'd know in two days. Every one of those things took two days, one prep, one shoot day, and then we would just march through all those productions. And then the, well, I guess it wasn't the last scene, it was the penultimate chapter when you get married. And I was thinking, okay, is this a graduate? All right, <laughs> where, 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 where ben, Benjamin's coming in, or but he, he didn't come in, you guys went out. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, it, it was a little bit of a twist on what happens. Funny too, because like we were talking about every piece in the puzzle, every cog is important. Really in those scenarios, it's exactly true because all the background, everyone had to be so coordinated because you don't want to be the one 12 minutes and 45 seconds into a continuous take to flub your line or, you know, or, or the guy holding the bounce board to step two inches to his left and get in the frame. And so, you know, that was really, that really felt like a, a team effort. And it was fun because everyone felt the pressure, you know, everyone feels the pressure in when a scene is rolling, but really everyone feels the pressure when you're, you're running long takes and no one wants to be the one to mess it up. Well, there's some just beauty to that in cinema. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, sometimes uh, my own experience is an actor will give you a performance. Sometimes an actor will give you a puzzle and then you have to piece it together, you know? Yeah. And you're, that movie really demanded performances and not a puzzle. Yeah. And, and, it's, and, and I think, you know, I, I very much, and I say this without enough experience to say this, I'm okay with experimentation. I'm okay with like f finding different things or playing around with moments. But I think the thing that can be variable is character motivation and character journey. Um, and those things I think have to be constants because I think if an actor plays from, from a clear, consistent character motivation in the scene, mm -hmm. their actions can be variable, but yet it will still come out the same as an, an, in the edit. You'll know where you're starting, it'll feel consistent, and you'll know where you're headed. And so I think it's really important to have conversations with my actors about motivation, desire, needs, obstacle um, as a priority for characters in a given scene, because as long as those are consistent, the movie stays whole. I think where movies get into trouble is that they're like, well, oh, try this one like you're mad. You know, try this one like you're like you're you're like you're off in the corner and you're just not paying attention. And and I think if you do that without a clear character motivation being the constant in that moment, you end up getting, you know, sort of things that feel disjointed or things where you're not really engaged with the emotional journey. And I think that's more important in comedy than anything else. I think in comedy, because of the improv nature of our contemporary comedy of the multicam sort of like crack a joke and who can outdo each other in the improv in the moment, which is fine and fun and, and has its value. I think we've maybe lost sight a little bit uh, in the grand scheme. I think there's a lot of people who are, are staying the course, but in the grand scheme, I think we've lost a little track of the fact that character motivation in comedy is even more important, I think, you know, to keep, to keep in mind as you, as you put a movie together. My favorite movie of all time is The Apartment. To see the things you just spoke about, where yeah. you see the great jokes, yeah. the beautiful setup and payoff, the mise en scene, the use of props, yeah. the, the, the conception with the writing, and the deep themes at the at the core of it, with tragedy and comedy like on the same razor's edge. To wow. me, that's my favorite movie of all time for it's that great, reason. It's a great movie, and and I think uh, uh, exactly to that point. I think you're exactly right. They say in Casablanca, the fundamental things always apply, and that's like logic character kind of goes back to Stanislavski and all the, the acting school stuff. Yeah. Quick question I have, you know, you sometimes, you know, actors don't want to hear that shit. Like, what the fuck? I, my motivation is to get my health insurance back, you know, yeah. like, uh, oh, oh, which yeah. has been a big motivation for me, actually, in my career. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to keep it, get it back, please. Um, yeah. And so when you're dealing with people that have been on Mount Olympus, you know, with Oscars and Rita's gotten them all, you know, she's she's got the whole um, the MVP thing going. How, how willing or able or eager were they to have those kind of conversations and interaction with you? They all were completely willing and, and interested. I think all of them prioritized it. I think that I think if you get to the point on on a set where where you say what's your motivation and someone says money, um, I think that I think that you've you've lost, you've lost them. You know what I mean? I think all actors want to do great work fundamentally. You know what I mean? It just like all artists want to do the best work they can. And I think when they feel like they're unable to do their best work, they'll check out and you'll sort of lose, you'll lose the potency of that moment. And, and I think, you know, it's, it's very incumbent on me as a director to continue to consult their interest and willingness in order to keep them engaged with the characters in the moment. And I think, 
And I think in the sense of like, what's my motivation? The scene is sort of like the generic, like, you know, the TV movie director statement. If you were like, oh, he's a director and he's telling him what their motivation is. But the truth is, is that it really is at the core of, of everything. And it is a very fundamental truth. And I think if you, if someone really cares about what's happening in that moment in the performance, it's the most anchoring concept for an actor to just say, great, what, what I really want in this moment is to just to go to the bathroom. Like mm -hmm. that's what my, that's my motivation right now. I want to go pee. And this guy keeps telling me a long list of everyone who's coming to the party. And it's like, go. And it's just like, that's a perfect potent moment for comedy because because that's all that really matters. You know, if I said, okay, he's gonna read a list to you and you just feel awkward, it just doesn't have the same, it just doesn't have the re same resonance. And so I think that's sort of my lens always to, to think with. What's actable, you know, is, is, is those things. You can't act a result. Right. Um, yeah, you have to act, a, you have to act a motivation. You have to act a, a thought. Yeah, and I think the key for me, is to be completely imbued in the circumstances of whatever the situation is yeah. to give it whatever truth you can. I mean, in the case of 80 for Brady, for, for my little moment or moments was this is the actual most desperate moment of this contest. This, this series, if they get a first down, it's over. So we are as concentrated and focused on trying to, and then, What's unanticipated, of course, is what happens. But right. my movie is this game. Yeah, right. And and actually, they were getting slaughtered yeah. <laughs> in, yeah. that, in that game. Oh, in that moment, yeah. yeah. And what's crazy, what, what's interesting is that is that it's one of the reasons I responded to what you were doing in, in your tape was because if you had a character in that scenario who is self-aware of the joke and sort of waiting for the joke of Jane Fonda to interrupt him and sort of hammed up a like, whoa, you know, a thing, it kills the it kills the joke because what makes it funny is how focused you are on your thing being interrupted by this person and your response to her invading into your privacy is a really genuine response. And that's, people find that moment funny because you're so convicted, you're, you're, you have so much conviction towards the real task at hand. And I think that that's the, for me, when I'm sort of finding or flagging people, I try and I try and find the people who are chasing the real scene because that's the funniest version of the scene. It's not the comedian who's really good at stand up, who like I know can ham it up and wink at the camera. That's I, me, stand up, 10, 20, 30 years, stand up, but you know. But, but stand up, but not, but not stand up in the sense that you have the, you have the dead <laughs> and flat version of it. You know what I mean? And so I, I think that, I think that what I'm always searching for are people who have conviction in their scenes because that's where real comedy comes from. Real comedy comes from belief in what you're doing is real. It's, you know, it's clowns, basically. You're just saying we're all clowns and clowns are completely committed to the universe in which they live. They're trying to get into a tiny fire truck and, and it's too small for them and that's hilarious, but they don't think so. Right, know? right. So you, you can't, you, that's why the circumstances are the guideposts of, the, yeah. of, whatever, it, of whatever it is. You did a, a great job. My own story is I, I directed a feature that I wrote, The Solar Opposite, and I've written nine others. Yep. And uh, they're all highly representative of the best part of me, but getting those back into the arena has been, uh, you know, challenging. And yeah. one of the things I was like, this guy, this is his first film and he gets a studio picture with, <laughs> with the, you add those resumes together, you probably have, pretty much have the, the greatest all-star cast in movies of all time, plus the greatest football player of all time, which is inarguable. Wow. That's one of the great Hollywood survival stories I've ever heard of yours. Yeah, I mean, the truth is that, you know, I put in, I put in close to a decade of hard work in indie film uh -huh. in to get that opportunity, you know? So it, it, it all feels like somewhat overnight success, but the reality is, is like, we're all fighting. I have scripts that I've been trying to sell forever too. Like it, it's sort of one of those things where it's weird to say it because it's like persistence pays off because sometimes persistence doesn't pay off, but all you can do is, keep trying, you know what I mean? Like, what do you, what do you say to someone other than like, keep trying and, and keep working. And I, I think the key thing is to keep doing 
the things that make you happy and the things that you feel are your integrity towards your creative process, the things that you think are fun and important. And if you hold true to those things, eventually, you know, eventually something will pop. And if it doesn't, at least you feel like you've contributed your small things to a small community, but it felt like you being authentically you. And I think that's, you know, that's the best we can do is just to continue to do the things that we find entertaining and interesting um, and, and put them out in the world. Right. Well, you did a great job on the movie. I'm relating to you now as this really subversively talented comic actor as well. And uh, congratulations to that. And I mean, thanks for putting me in the movie, man. Yeah. I've made a great job. I'll say, I, knew I, I, I knew I couldn't be cut out because I go, this is the key moment. I mean, they can, <laughs> they yeah, can cut the it. dancers out. They can't cut this moment out. That's yeah. right. You got it. You were, you were in for sure. No, it was, it was great working with you. And, and again, it, I, think, I think it really resonated. Your, your commitment to the role really resonated and I think paid off. It paid dividends for me. Oh, uh, thank you. Your execution. <laughs> oh, you're so sweet, Kyle. I really enjoyed the process and just being there with the the ladies and each one was, you know, very interesting and unique as just people to me yeah. in in their own own right. And, you know, you think about Jane, I, I had this little moment where she was standing as we were prepping the scene and I'm, because of the circumstance, I'm sitting and she's 80 something. And I go, would you just like to sit down? She goes, no, I'm a trooper. And I just, yeah, you are, you know, and I, you know, and you know what I saw? I saw our father too. I saw young man, Mr. Lincoln and the Jode family and, you know, the Lady yeah. Eve, another great movie. Oh my God, the Preston Sturgis comedy. Um, yeah, it's funny. We talked about Preston Sturgis a bunch. She, she loves Preston Sturgis and, and I, I happen to have an affinity towards it, um, towards his work. And so, and we, we hit it off on, on Preston in our first conversation. Oh, brother, where art thou? Yeah, yeah exactly. The great movie from Sullivan's Travels. Right. Veronica Lake was so beautiful in that movie. My jaw drops. You know, it's just he was doing something really special. Those are those early. Those are some of those early. You know, those early uh, cinema films that are just like profound, um, profound pieces of work. And they're very. They're, you know, yes, they're funny, but they always cut to some very deep social concerns, wow. generally about class and even race. Um, in in the, the movie of uh, Sullivan's Travels, totally. You know, yeah, the, it's about poverty in America. You're traveling through things that people generally didn't film. Like you're not filming the side of railroad tracks where people are starving for food. The black church where they watch the cartoon, where he, you know, comes to understand the the beauty of comedy. You yeah. know, I mean, it, what's interesting is that there was so much, there was a lot of um, social commentary, which I think is always part and parcel of, of cinema. Um, but it's done in a way that I think it travels the path of it and doesn't necessarily overly dictate what you should or shouldn't think in the moment. And the funny thing is, I think most people, I hope most people walk away with the same uh, sense of empathy and understanding from that film without the need to sort of like put it in, put it into a framework that feels like you're being fed something. You know, I think the beauty of his movies is he laid it out for you and put your feet on the path and made you empathize um, with, with people who, you know, who needed empathy in that moment. Right. With the old joke about Hollywood, you, you got a message call Western union. Okay. Get that stuff off the screen, you know, yeah. <laughs> and, and um, you did it too in 80 for Brady, yeah. because we do live in a society today where, uh, we get people of a certain age get disposed. They get shuttled into uh, senior living centers or elderly orgy hostels, whichever yeah. you'd like to call them. Um, <laughs> I thought there was a little bit of that kind of perhaps going on. And um, yeah, yeah um, we, we, we did a nod to that. In the <laughs> yeah. Um, but you did that and it was subtle and it was something that was still there. And we see it also in Hollywood, you know, yeah. our own movies. And yeah. this movie was loaded with special effects. 80 for Brady was. The special effects were human emotion, fun dialogue, yeah. and empathy, which yeah. comes across, you know, even to the people that are living on Mount Olympus by that, of course, Tom Brady and our football stars. You know, they were reached. I just want to congratulate you on so many levels. First, for casting me. <laughs> and uh, two for the movie and the, the incredible act of juggling all these balls and uh, of all the stories and the 
technical challenges and creating a tapestry where you believe the Super Bowl. And um, man, just good luck, Kyle. Anything that, uh, you know, I could tell my agent to look out for in the future, you know, on the call? Uh, yeah, no, you, you know how it is in Hollywood, a thousand spinning plates. So maybe one of those plates falls soon and then, then we can talk. Okay, well, congratulations and just a super thanks for, for joining me. Yeah, my Great pleasure. Work. Yeah. All right, folks. Well, I want to sign off here and thank Kyle. And as I always do, offer my sign off word, and that is namaste, shalom, and aloha. By that, I mean namashaloha. See ya.